These are the anti-democratic forces. These are the guys who want to use military mutiny, economic extortion, civil disobedience, withholding of medical services uh, to innocent children, blocking of commerce, and other anti-democratic means. And now, The Edwin Black Show. Sponsored by the books of Edwin Black. Available on Amazon and at booksellers worldwide. And now, here's Edwin. Welcome to the Edwin Black Show. I'm Edwin Black, investigative journalist, historian, and author of IBM and the Holocaust, War Against the Week and the Far Hood, and numerous other books in 200 editions in 40 languages, in 190 countries worldwide. If you like our show's content, spread the word. You can subscribe for alerts at theedwinblackshow.com. If you want to support our work, please visit theedwinblackshow.com slash support. Your help, big or small, assures our complete and utter intellectual and uncensored journalistic independence. We have solidarity today from many national organizations such as the Emerson Family Foundation, the Fuel Freedom Foundation, the Israel on Campus Coalition, as well as Stand With Us, JNS, the Israeli American Council, Emmet, American Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists, Scholars for Peace in the Middle East, ZOA Michigan, the Growth Family Center, Americans for Peace and Tolerance, and plenty more. That said, I say thank you to everyone. I only speak for myself and for history. Today's episode is sponsored without any preconditions, requests, or or stipulations by the Southwest Jewish Congress in Dallas, which is working every day to bring Jews and Christians together in harmony and mutual respect. Today, we welcome guests from across America, including our four watch parties. We have them in the villages, Newton, Massachusetts, Chicago, and Tampa Bay is back. Overseas, I see viewers logged on from, again, Australia and New Zealand, Holland again, France, I see Italy, Hungary, that's interesting, Germany, South Africa, Great Britain, Canada, Israel, Morocco again, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, and other countries. If you have a question limited to today's topics, place one short sentence in Zoom's QA feature. The Edwin Black Show, along with our YouTube site, is global and fast growing, enjoying many tens of thousands of views. We speak frankly and without partisanship to a fragmented world seeking better understanding of our tormented past, our present, very, very tense, and a future still uncertain. And remember, we will not be censored. By the way, stay tuned for my special word of wisdom at the very end of the show, just before I sign off. We'll get to our always exciting show, Unanswered Questions, this one, episode 13, in a few minutes, after some brief announcements, plus our items from the week. Announcements. At the Edwin Black Show and our companion YouTube site, we have just released three newly edited and visually gripping episodes. First, we go back and take a deep dive into the John Durham investigation, see the strength of his cases versus the absence of convictions. Second, just in time for the Jewish holiday starting in a few days, we recall that Vermont is America's most anti-Semitic and anti-Israel state, and we document with visual punch how the Burlington City Council afflicted America's Jews on the days of awe that is just before the eve of Yom Kippur. You can see the episode. And remember, people should boycott all Vermont goods, services, and vacations. Third, you'll see a revelatory chunk of truth on electric vehicles, past, present, and future. See them all in hundreds of other videos at theedwinblackshow.com or search YouTube for The Edwin Black Show channel. My appearance tour continues across America and overseas. 
next month in October, I appear with Empower You of Cincinnati. See you soon, Betty. Then I return to Dallas for an encore presentation at the Embry Human Rights Center at SMU, that's a Southern Methodist University, discussing Israel, and a second lecture for the SMU Jewish Studies Department. Before year's end, I expect to be in the Tampa Bay area and California. I'm already scheduled into spring of 2024, most notably a three-event January series in South Florida with the Gross Family Center for the study of anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. Then in late February, a return to Mexico City for a powerful community-wide four-event series. In March of next year, I keynote the Canadian Privacy Conference in Ottawa. You can get details of all my appearances from edwinblack.com slash events, where my team has restored scores of event flyers going back to 2011. There you can see information on my many presentations at universities from Harvard to UCLA and before legislatures from the British Parliament to the Israeli Knesset in cities from Sydney, Australia to Brussels to Jerusalem. It's a powerful reminder to me of my years long journey to connect with my readers and viewers. And let's meet up in your city. Now some major items from the week. Due to our time constraints, I can only cover a few of the many that attracted attention. First, our weekly AI update. Of the many daily AI threats and developments that we monitor here at the Edwin Black Show, I've selected two of the most significant. First, a new category of risk has finally been formally identified and long overdue. The Netherlands has now published a report on what they call algorithmic risks and AI risks. That is, treating those threats like it would an unsafe environment or an unsafe workplace. The newly created Directorate of Algorithm Coordination at the Dutch Data Protection Authority will be registering, examining, and rating the automated systems that control our life. It will be calling for risk warnings. The Dutch regulators will be coordinating with other international bodies, such as the G7, the OECD, UNESCO, Council of Europe, and the European Union. The new agency has a portal where you can file a complaint and provide risk information about any algorithm you encounter. I applaud this step and add that every time an AI function is engaged in a disseminated product or service, a warning label should be flashed. Even still, I know that every attempt to regulate will be circumvented and actually fooled by both the AI culprits in our world and the AI menaces trying to control our world. Second, the newspaper giant Gannett, which owns USA Today and numerous local newspapers, became an early experimenter with AI written sports stories. The Columbus Dispatch was among the newspapers that published articles that were termed goofy by its critics. Among the awkward AI phrasing was referring to a game as a quote, close encounter of the athletic kind, close quote. I'm reminded of all the robot voice assistants that pretend they are human and ask you to help train them. AI-generated articles should be rejected ipso facto. I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, I will never allow AI to contribute to anything I publish. When the font of man's knowledge is not created by man, but by machine, it will no longer be knowledge. It will be conditioning. Blow up the servers before the servers blow you up. Items from the week, and now we get to that part of the show, and what a week it has been. Item one, Eritrean violence in Israel. Before Israel erected its wall along its southern desert border, approximately 30, 40, even 50,000 Eritreans walked across the baking desert to illegally enter Israel. This appears to be a case of economic migration and purely illegal. About 85% of these illegals are single men. 
Israel has given most of them temporary sanctuary. Once the wall was erected, border breaches went down from many thousands per year to less than 10 individuals per year. But this Eritrean community in Israel is now very violently rioting in Israel because they oppose political developments in their home country. They are split into pro-regime and anti-regime elements. That's the Eritrean regime, complete with flags, national colors, and placards. In this recent riot, they used clubs, holes, cement, and other street weapons to attack each other and the police who tried to come between them. Scores were injured in what local hospitals called an unprecedented mass casualty event, unlike anything seen in Tel Aviv. These people, must be deported immediately. And that's what the Bibi administration seeks to do. First, the Eritreans who violently support the current regime, complete with signage, cannot be said to be asylum seekers. They support the regime. Moreover, nearly all of them entered by a third country, Islamic Egypt. Their claim to flee Eritrea because of mandatory military conscription leaves out the fact that Israel, since the Jewish state, also relies upon mandatory military conscription. So where did you flee to? Eritreans have staged similar violent riots in Calgary, Copenhagen, and various German cities. In Israel, a few have committed outrageous crimes against innocent people, such as the rape of an 83-year-old grandmother by a 17-year-old Eritrean man. They need to be deported at once. The UN opposes it, but the UN can't even spell Uyghur. So who cares what the UN says? Scores of the most violent rioters have now been picked up as Israel prepares to take action. Remember, it was Eritrea that broke off from peaceful Ethiopia and fought a vicious war against that country. This whole Eritrean mess comes up just as Israel continues telescoping its excellent engagement with Africa, flying in hundreds of endangered Ethiopians and establishing vibrant diplomatic bridges and social assistance with such nations as Ghana and the Ivory Coast. Item two, we are edging closer to a global military conflagration. First, in response to the understandably increasing Ukrainian attacks inside Russia, Russian President Vladimir Putin has vocally, again, warned the West that he may use nuclear weapons. Belarus is the arm of Putin's nuclear threats. In recent days, Belarusian stooge President Alexander Lukashenko has declared, quote, we have missiles and bombs that we have received from Russia. The bombs are three times more powerful than those dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's a close quote. Lukashenko adds, quote, get this, God forbid I have to make a decision to use those weapons today, but there would be no hesitation if we face an aggression, period, close quote. Now remember, when it comes to Putin, aggression can be real, it can be imagined, or it can be faked. At the same time, Russia has openly placed its hypersonic Satan II missiles, also known as RS-28 Sarmats, on combat-ready status. Each Satan II carries 15 unregulated MIRV nuclear warheads, tactical warheads. A Russian defense official bragged openly that the Satan II's launched in Russia or Belarus could reach London in 200 seconds. Repeat, 200 seconds. The heightened tensions, the North Korean dictator is preparing to meet Putin and enter into a major weapon supply for Russia's war against Ukraine. Plainly put, Russia is running out of munitions and needs North Korea's excess. In return, North Korea is said to expect satellite and hypersonic missile technology from Moscow. The final piece of jitters on the international scene comes from China, which is approving all of these Russian and North Korean maneuvers. China's chief of state, Xi, will not attend the G20 summit next door in India. 
Why? China no longer needs the G20. Plus, in the past 48 hours, China has been moving massive columns of combat vehicles into two embarkation cities near the Taiwan coast. It's a buildup reminiscent of Putin's when he moved massive forces along the Ukrainian border without challenge from Washington. Indeed, what's Washington doing about it? Washington is preoccupied with a program to deliberately not replenish our dwindled strategic oil and ammunition reserves and instead concentrate on bogus gender distractions, hypocritical and nonsensical climate policy, poisonous partisan politics, and appeasement of our global adversaries. America, it's not our pronouns that are in peril. It's our populations that are in peril. And they will be if Russia detonates even one demonstration nuclear device. If China follows through on its staunch commitment to invade Taiwan and seize 80% of the global semiconductor industry, and or if Beijing decides to reveal some of the extraordinary blackmail it has amassed on the Biden crime family. That's Biden from Hunter to Joe. I would do more, but so many of the crises we are facing right now are covered by the many unanswered questions I have accumulated. I will now move to the main thrust of our episode. I have plenty of questions. Here they are. All right, we're going to start with the villages. Hi, guys. In your last show, you said millions of illegals will have to be removed. How will this be possible? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I think it was asked once before. The game plan was to bring in millions of illegals so that it would be a humanitarian crisis if we tried to remove them. But what else can be done? We cannot have a two-tiered system. We cannot have uh, masses of individuals in the legal immigration system functioning alongside illegals. All of these people who have come in, there's more than two million, have alleged court dates. We should expedite those court dates. We should give them the judgment. And if the judgment is that they don't have asylum, and it is estimated that more than 90% will not have asylum, then they should be immediately removed and deported to the nations from which they came, which now include not only Latin America, but every continent on earth except Antarctica. Okay, second question. Oh, by the way, if that means hundreds of thousands are removed in a swoop, then that's what it must be. From the watch party in Newton, Mass. We are getting closer to the election, so the Democrats are pushing COVID. Will new mask mandates work? I say no, mask mandates will not work after the mockery of the mask protocol that Biden just made. You may recall that, unfortunately, our first lady, uh, to everyone's regret, uh, contracted another case of uh, COVID despite her many vaccinations and boosters. And there was a protocol that Biden should wear a mask even indoors. So there was just a Medal of Honor ceremony and Biden ceremoniously walked into the ceremony wearing his mask. And then he took off his mask within six inches of the recipient to put the Medal of Honor on him. And then he somehow, with his mask off, just continued walking right through the crowd and left the room. No one even knows why. So in other words, he came in wearing the mask. He left out without a mask. To leave no mistake, Biden came into a White House event after that, waving his mask and saying, look, they told me to wear the mask. Don't tell anyone, but I'm not going to wear it. So if that's what the president is doing, it's going to be hard to bring out the we're not sure story of masking mandates with every uh, county, every city, every organization, every state with a different masking mandate. So it's not going to happen. Next, we go to now if you're 
sending me messages. I'm going to get them, but right now I'm going to the pre-submitted ones. Watch party in Chicago. Oh, this is nice. I read your novel Format C colon, based in Chicago, about a writer who drove his car up the down ramp. Did you actually drive your car up a down ramp? <laughs> yes, I did, and it wasn't that little red one that was featured in the book. I drove a great big. I think it was a Bonneville. We used to have four newspapers in、uh, in Chicago. One of them still is the Chicago Sun Times. They used to print their own newspaper and load it up into trucks. And those trucks, big trucks, would spread out across the city. They would all come down a down ramp to get to the highway, and it was exclusively for the Sun Times and for their trucks being dispatched down. They came in a different entrance. And this would be about seven times a day. You never knew if they were coming down late or in mass or whatever it is. And I used to have a kind of a、uh, a personal test. I would play chicken with those trucks, and I would drive right up the down ramp. It would take me about five or ten seconds. I would do it at、uh, full speed. And I'm here to talk about.、It. I'm glad you read my novel. I'm glad someone did. All right, Sheldon in Manhattan. What can stop Bibi Netanyahu's Who in Israel? And there's some other stuff here about destroying democracy. Okay, so there's a lot of misunderstanding about this. There is no coup in Israel. I'd like to explain that Bibi Netanyahu is the head of a coalition of six different, basically,、uh, oppositional parties. They have some things in common, but a lot of things not in common. They disagree about uh, religious uh, activities. They disagree about what should be done in settlements, et cetera, et cetera. Bibi Netanyahu cannot order a pizza without permission and consent of his other parties. That's a democratic action, and so there is no coup. The effort to establish reasonableness as part of basic law. Reasonableness that the Supreme Court can no longer decide what is reasonable, but only the people, the basic law, and the executive can decide what is reasonable. That was passed after three laborious readings, after months of debate, and then a final 27,000 objections were each parsed and decided upon. That's a democratic process. That's not a coup. Now, if you want to know where the crisis is going to really come in, and by the way, here's a good chance for me to say there have been these massive、um, protests in Tel Aviv every weekend. Hundred thousand here, hundred thousand there. This is a small, vocal, persistent minority in Israel. These are the anti-democratic forces. These are the guys who want to use military mutiny. Economic extortion, civil disobedience, withholding of medical services to innocent children, blocking of commerce, and other anti-democratic means to undo a democratic election that they lost by a landslide. But they believe that if only 3.8 percent of the population continuously protests, that they will crack the government. This, according to several studies. They have read and actually have quoted. Ehud Barak is the main exponent of this. They're being aided by a、uh, uh, an English language media, which stresses everything negative. For instance, here's a headline, and it says, "Foreign investments in Israel plunged 60 percent in the first quarter of this year." Now, why did they do that? Well, if you read down in, in the story after the big. Headline: It says that the foreign ministry explained that there were devaluations of、uh, the major technology companies in the United States that lowered that investment, and this follows, shall I say, 29.5 billion, which was a record year in 2022, and another record year of 47 billion in 2021. So what that means. Is once you put in 66 billion dollars, that investment has got to grow. Right underneath this article, there was another 
article that a new technology company in Israel, Patango, P-I-T-A-N-G-O, has just raised $175 million to seed new startups. This is on top of the $25 billion just invested by Intel, and I believe $12 billion invested by Amazon. So basically, the media can't be believed. Hope that answers your question. Um, that was Sheldon in Manhattan. Murray in Omaha. How much land did Israel take from the Palestinians? I suppose that's uh, when Israel was formed. I would say when Israel was formed, Israel took little to no land from Palestinians. The Arabs didn't own but about eight to 10% of the land. The rest of the land was owned by the Turkish government, which then eschewed to the League of Nations British mandate of Jewish Palestine. And the local Arabs preferred to sell land to Jews at triple and quadruple, and sometimes even 10 times the cost because they knew the Jews were desperate on buying land so that they could settle. So uh, there was some land which was uh, occupied because when the war was fought, which uh, the Arabs called the War of Extermination, uh, about a, a third of those Arabs left of their own free will because they thought that it was a war zone and unsafe and they'd be back in a couple of weeks when the Arabs destroyed the Jews and about a third were run off by uh, the Israelis as part of a war zone and another third just fled because they just didn't want to be part of a war zone and were following instructions from the Arab armies. The problem that the British always had to face in the years leading up to Israeli independence was how to undo legal land purchases. And so they struggled to find rules, regulations, and procedures to defrock legitimate landowners from land that they had paid for with a great deal of money. So obviously all of the people who fled their house, they received compensation just as they did in any other country. Those compensations are held in accounts. Some people have claimed them, a lot of people have not. That's the answer there. Melanie in Jacksonville. Does Israel have nuclear weapons? You mean does Israel have between 80 and 100 nuclear warheads? Okay, so Israel prefers some a doctrine called nuclear ambiguity. So they've never confirmed that in 1979 there was a atomic test alleged in uh, South Africa of an Israeli nuclear bomb which was observed by the United States in a big flash which has constantly been debated. I should say that Israel has a nuclear triad capability. The United States has a triad that's air, ground-based, and sea-based missiles. Well, Israel now has a fleet of Dolphin and Dolphin II uh, naval vessels. It's true they're diesel powered, but they're capable of carrying nuclear warheads. In addition, Israel has the Jericho missile, which can carry a nuclear warhead, and there's certain other things which I won't go into that fly in the air, which can carry a nuclear warhead. Uh, but Israel prefers to say it does not have any nuclear warheads. Okay, hope that answers your question. By the way, Israel has a nuclear research uh, facility in Demona, but it has no nuclear power supply, so they're just researching isotopes. And I should say that the cafeteria just down the street from that nuclear facility is quite an excellent one. They have some great salads, and you'll see it because there's all these hubcaps around the place. Thank you, Melanie. Peter and Marcia in Los Angeles. Quote, my right, the right of my wife and my children to move around Judea and Samaria is more important than the freedom of movement for the Arabs. The right to life comes before freedom of movement. Was this a racist or not a racist statement 
by leader of Israel? The answer is it was not. First of all, it's true. You have to understand that in Israel, on a nice day, uh, a woman, uh, sometimes a petite woman, sometimes an elderly woman, can be just walking by on the street and ask you a simple question like, uh, where's the grocery store, where's the pharmacy, where's the street? You turn your back and pull out a knife and they start stabbing you and they've been trained to stab up here in the neck on a downward trajectory and this happens a lot. We have many of the videos. There are ramming examples where cars ram into Jews waiting for bus stops. Doesn't matter if they're elderly Jews or young Jews, there have been shooting incidents. Uh, in Chicago, we had a curfew. You had to be in by either 10.30 or 11.30, depending upon your age. That was for safety. If a, a group of the population is engaged in uh, crime, uh, not all of the population, but neighborhoods of the population is producing crime, terrorist crime, it's okay to say there's a curfew. And I realized that if this were happening in Chicago, everyone would understand. But it's happening in Israel, and Israel is supposed to be right next to heaven, and they think it should not occur there. Hope that answers your question. Thank you for all the questions you ask every week. All right, here is a note from Wes. The science is clear on masks of, on N94, 95 variety. They absolutely protect others if you are sick, and offer you limited protection from other viral particles. Do you agree with this assessment? If you felt sick but were not yet sure, would you wear a mask while in a crowded indoor space? I actually have another question about that, and I'm gonna combine that. I'm gonna skip ahead, and it says here, from Raymond in Miami, should we always obey scientists, or should we also fear them? Absolutely do not obey scientists and absolutely reject one of the most dangerous terms that we know, which is scientific consensus. Let me tell you a few things. First of all, the term mad scientist was not invented last Thursday. It's been with us for many generations. Now, we recently had this debate within my organization. Let me talk to you about the scientists of prior generations. Adolf Hitler went to war, and the entire German scientific establishment, and virtually the entire scientific establishment of Europe, helped him commit genocide, helped create fake anthropology, fake medical science, elected to do experiments on innocent people, on twins, by drowning them in ice water, the major engineers. Uh, we wouldn't be in outer space today if the Nazi space engineer who made Nazi rockets, Werner von Braun, wasn't brought over. An Operation Paperclip was not just for Werner von Braun. There were scores of uh, scientists who were seated throughout the Western countries, Nazi scientists. They were chemists. They were psychologists. They were construction engineers. And throughout history, we have seen that science has been put for a deadly purposes. In fact, the Holocaust Museum had a, a traveling exhibit called Deadly Science. It was deadly science that helped colonial regimes conquer and destroy and rape and murder what they called inferior people in Africa who made it possible to justify that the Africans, the black people of Africans, were talking baboons. They weren't actually human beings, so they put Odo Benga, zoologists put Odo Benga in the monkey cage in uh, the Bronx Zoo. The Autobahn was built with scientists. Climate scientists were in the service of the Third Reich every hour of every day. Who do you think was doing the weather service for the Nazis for the Normandy crossing to find out if the land, if the waves would be calm, if there would be storms. That was the climate scientists and they were aided with uh, the Hollerith punch cards uh, that IBM provided. And we had climate scientists 
in the United States also using those same cards, which were providing that same information to the Eisenhower forces. Remember, before Frankenstein was a monster, he was a scientist, a mad scientist. So I follow physics very closely. And every day, a different person comes out, a different scientist comes out with a different opinion on the origin of the universe, the existence of the universe, the size of the universe, the speed of the universe, on our own existence, on the creation of everything we know, on whether there's one dimension or 12 dimensions, whether we're governed by atoms or by string theories. Even when Einstein spoke, it was called the theory of relativity. And the scientific method is to challenge the science. No science can exist without challenge and science cherishes the challenge because that is how it has replicability. Now, if you wanna use science for political purposes. If you want to say, everybody should mask up, but I'm London Breen, I'm the mayor of San Francisco, and I'm in a nightclub, and I don't feel like uh, putting my mask on. If you want to be Joe Biden and walk in the room wearing a mask and walk out of the room without a mask, and then say, see, I'm not, I'm not wearing the mask, don't tell anybody. If you want to have 3,000 versions of what the mask should do, because remember, there are 3,000 counties in the United States, there are 50 states, there are territories. And I remember being in Washington where we crossed the street and there was a different mask mandate. One said yes and one said no. So the one thing you need to understand, Wes, is that science has been the muscle of genocide and disaster and war in our world. Now I love modern science. And I'm all for modern science. And I study modern science. And I live by modern science. But science must serve, not rule. Hope that makes it clear to both of you, uh, including the gentleman in... Um... And by the way, please come back to me, Wes, and tell me that the language of science until 1945 was not German. It was in English wasn't French, it was German. Okay, Jeanette in Dallas, if the Democrats seize the government in the next election, what will happen to the Jews and how do we know? The Democrats seize the election, they seize the power of government, not a split government, but let's say uh, all three branches of the government, if Biden gets reelected or whoever will be standing in for Biden, and they take the House back and the Senate as they wish, then uh, Jews are in this country are in trouble. Let me be uh, specific. I'd like to say again, the Democratic Party, not Joe Biden as in any way as an individual, but hundreds of people at all levels of local and state office in this important fraction of the Democratic Party, the progressive wing, hate Jews. They hate Jews and they hate Israel. And they're waiting for the minute when they can get rid of the old guard and punish the Jews and get rid of Israel as a Jewish state. Now, I just came upon something here as I looked at your question. House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, just a couple of days ago, met with the progressive Democrats. That's uh, Representative Ilhan Omar and her colleagues and pledged, I'm reading, I'm quoting, despite their long anti-Semitic history, that he will back them to the hilt in the 2024 elections. Quote, Representative Omar has been elected. This is Hakeem Jeffries, an open friend of Israel and the Jewish people. Hakeem Jeffries, the House Minority Leader, says, Representative Omar has been elected by her constituents three times and has consistently stood up for them, including through her service on the House Budget Committee. Quoting, as House Democratic Leader, I vigorously endorse her reelection and stand with her as we battle extreme MAGA Republicans
for the future of our nation, close quote. And this is kind of interesting because I just concluded an interview, uh, which we're going to publish soon, uh, with Ken Abramowitz, the author of The Multi-Front War. And he's, he talked about all these uh, anti-Semitic groups in uh, the Democratic Party, the communists, the anarchists, the anti-Semites, the race baiters. And I corrected him. I said, you mean that's a fraction of the party? He said, yes, it's a fraction of the party, but it's not a fraction they're going to expel. They haven't purged the party of these people. And that's because these people have the ability, the organization and the energy to dethrone anyone in a primary to compete with any existing old guard guy, especially Nadler, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So until the Democratic Party can purge these Jew haters and Israel haters from their midst, then they're going to be a clear and present danger. Now, let's talk about exactly what they would do. What they would do is they would make special assessments against Jews. They will have FARA prosecutions against Jews, maybe any Jew who gave $18 to a Jewish group in Israel or to a hospital in Israel. They will immediately start uh, pressure campaigns and exclusion campaigns against Jews. Jews will be pauperized. Uh, Israel will be de-recognized. Hamas will be armed and recognized. In fact, I'm just looking right now and I see in a major article in Tablet Magazine that the United States and its anti-Semitic State Department has already been quietly undoing Israel's security requirements. You may remember that under Trump, they recognized the Golan Heights, this little strip as a piece of Israel. So what did they do? They snuck in, the United States delegation snuck in when no one was looking in the United States Security Council resolution, which was reauthorizing the disengagement force, the peacekeeping force on the Lebanese border, that this would exclude any territory between the territory of the state of Israel and the territories occupied by 1967. Remember, while Jewish people are losing sleep trying to figure out how to make a better, kinder, gentler Israel state, these Jew haters within the Democratic Party are quietly working to undo everything that would be supportive of Israel. And this is the same resolution foundation that Obama used in his scurrilous 2334. In addition, as we see, the uh, Biden administration joined the BDS. Now, what does that mean? They said that the US would cut science, technology cooperation with any Israel institution located on the West Bank. That means if Israel, which has many uh, discoveries involving science, medicine, cancer, uh, security, uh, discovered something four miles the other way or two miles the other way of an imaginary line, the U.S. doesn't want to have any part of it. This is what is happening. I'm only giving you a fragment of this. If you want to hear more, go to a show we have called Crystal Duct 2.0. We had part one earlier and part two. Part three is being scheduled soon. So the answer to your unfortunate question is that if our Jews help elect these Democrats, they're in for uh, not just subways, but they're in for trains. And this is what I believe. And the problem is that all these Jewish people are looking forward, looking up, and I'm looking backward. And I realize that history is on an LP. And every time it makes a revolution, we're back to where we started. Thank you for your question. Jeanette in Dallas, come see me. I'll be there next month at the uh, SMU uh, Embry Center for Human Rights, where we are trying to churn out uh, the next generation of human rights crusaders. Susanna in Los Angeles, it's the same question. Did the U.S. just undercut Israel at the U.N.? in some UN resolutions. I just stated what those UN resolutions are. And I have another question from Susanna, and she wants to know if um, there will be a constitutional crisis in 
Israel, probably within a week. So what does this mean? There is a law that was reasonably passed by the overwhelming majority in Israel after 27,000 reviews, after months of debate, and after three separate challenges. And this law was that the Supreme, this was the basic law, which is like our constitution, saying that the judicial uh, courts must enforce the law and not what they consider to be reasonable in the law. So imagine if we were recording, if we had modified the US constitution and somebody in the Supreme Court said, well, we don't think it's reasonable. They've actually done that numerous times. Remember the internment of the innocent Japanese Americans, and I mean innocent in World War II, was approved by the Supreme Court. So the Speaker of the Knesset has just stated that he does not believe that the Supreme Court can overrule the Constitution, or that is basic law. And this guy's name is Amir Ohana, and he was the Speaker of the Knesset. This means, listen here, that if the Supreme Court attempts to overturn the reasonableness provision, it only has one thing to back it up, the executive. The Supreme Court does not have an army. Now, the Supreme Court has already said, we're rushing back home from our visit to Germany, and all 15 of our justices are all going to hear this issue. And when the government asked for a few extra days, few extra days for this monumental decision with everything going on in the country, they said, no, you can't have a few extra days. So we're looking at something in the coming days where the Supreme Court of Israel actually says, you can't do this. And the legislature and the executive say, yes, we can. In fact, I'll give you a further quote. It says here, quote, the situation will lead to an unprecedented incident in a democratic country. Recognize the limits of your power, says Ohana. Not only those other branches of government, recognize that in a democracy, no branch is all powerful. The court system in Israel is a monarchy and we believe in checks and balances and no one can invalidate constitutional law or basic law in Israel. Let's say that we have a constitutional amendment. Let's say we vote that the Equal Rights Amendment should go forward for whatever reason. And a bunch of guys and women in the Supreme Court decide, oh, uh, we don't think this is good. They don't have the right to invalidate the Constitution. So watch for it in the coming days. Okay, let's see what we got here. Sybil in Montreal, was the Maui fire and its incredible destruction caused by global warming or man-made mistakes? Okay, so Maui has two natural formations, two volcanic mountains, and they create a dry zone on the slope next to where, where the flash fire occurred. The electrical company uh, was charged with uh, maintaining their lines and the area underneath their lines. This they did not do, that they did not clean up the underbrush, which is the cause of many natural fires. Some of their lines collapsed because they're put on weak poles and that caught fire. And then not only was the fire started, and I saw the fire, it raced forward about a mile a minute. I saw it race. And the guy in charge of the water supply to the fire department decided to delay all water for five hours so they couldn't battle the blaze, they couldn't contain it. And then people were blocked when they tried to escape by a highway patrolman who said, you can't use the one road out of here. And more than that, the guy in charge of the warning system said, I decided not to deploy the warning system. These are a lot of activities and people had nowhere to run. They ran into the sea. This is a terrible conflagration and constellation of human error, stupidity. It doesn't mean that there's no threat to our climate. Climate change, as I said in the recent show, is real, very real. Climate policy is a fraud by and large. 
And as a result of this, the answer to your question was, climate danger is as real as could be. It's changing. And you could ask anyone anecdotally. You don't need a scientist for that. But uh, it did not cause the Maui flash fires that killed so many. And now there are so many people who are suing the electrical companies and so many people who are suing the telephone and cable companies about all of these wires. And the guys who were in charge of making these mistakes have either been reassigned or they've quit. And then vultures are now coming in to buy up that property and turn it into some kind of a high rent condo area. That's another topic. Thank you for your question. Stan in Manhattan, Stan the man in Manhattan. Did a man get himself into a woman's college sorority by declaring himself to be a girl? Yes, he did. The name of the sorority is Kappa Kappa Gamma. I don't approve of sororities and uh, fraternities in any sense of the imagination. I was always independent in college. But uh, Kappa Kappa Gamma, apparently seven of the members of Kappa Kappa Gamma in Montana, I guess it is, or Wyoming, I'm not sure which, sued to get rid of this guy. And they said that this guy was leering at him. He's a big 200 pound bruiser and he was having a male response, a physical male response cited in the lawsuit as he saw them and they're uncomfortable. So I just want to say this. I think it's gone too far, and I'm going to make some statements here. I'm going to introduce two words. One is trans freedom. Anybody, whether it's Rudy Giuliani or the guy who wants the weightlifter with the big beard and the heavy muscles and wants to declare themselves a woman, that's your personal business. You do your job, you fulfill your mandate as a human being, and we judge you on that not your identity, you have the freedom to do any of that. Here's the second word that I'm originating and coining right now. Trans fraud is where you take this identity and use it in a fraudulent way to enter a woman's only sports competition or organization. Now, it's great. You could be a 200 pound, stocky, heavily bearded man and say, I'm gonna enter this women's weightlifting competition and I'll get myself $10,000. I'll get myself $20,000. I'll make lots of money. And that money is there as an incentive for women's sports. Now, women have been victimized by men in our society since the beginning of humanity. And it didn't stop when this country got put into shape. This country kept women as second-class citizens until 1920. They couldn't vote. Even when I was growing up, and I'm sure some of the people listening to me will remember this, a woman lost her credit privileges when she got divorced. They canceled all of her credit cards. Women had to fight their way into the corporate room. The term casting couch, the Harvey Weinsteins of the world, that wasn't done because these were men. That was done because there were vulnerable women. And now, after working so hard to establish women's rights, the men are gonna figure out another way to invade their privacy, victimize them in bathrooms, victimize them by entering their beauty contests, taking away their rights, leering at them. We're so worried about women and girls being abused in public bathrooms. And now we see that there was a woman and she saw a guy in a bathroom and he was leering at these little kids taking their bathing suits off. She saw there was a physical response from this guy and she told him to get out and they banned her. They banned her from that place. So trans freedom, you got it. Trans fraud, you don't got it. Now, let me tell you something. I work every day and for many years with uh, many groups that identify with, with certain other groups that they are not. For example, I work very closely with a Jewish group and there's no Jews in this Jewish group, but they admire Judaism and they try to promote good relations between Jews and Christians and I'm all for it. But it doesn't mean that they can then say, oh, now I get reparations from the Holocaust. Now I get to be a citizen of Israel 
or anything of that. And the same goes for this Rachel woman who said, you know, I'm black, I think I'm black, my parents are European, they're white, but I identify with black. Go ahead, go ahead and do that, I'm all for it. But uh, then don't stand in line for reparations. Now, I also see at the same time, while some states and localities are fighting back, there was a lawsuit in Alabama about whether surgeries can be applied to little kids. And they tried to um, subpoena Rachel Levine as the number one expert in the United States Health Service on the subject of transgender. So uh, Mr. Levine was originally Richard Levine. He had two children. First wife was Martha. His two children are David and Dana. This is a man. He prefers to take a female name and to look like a woman. And that's his privilege. Apparently he's a gifted doctor and he's a gifted pediatrician and he can help those uh, who he's uh, talking to. But uh, the Department of Justice entered this local case as in a special case so that they could preclude Rachel Levine, originally Richard Levine, from testifying or being asked any questions. That makes me wonder what is going on. I'd like to just finish by saying this. Everyone on this planet, just about, with few exceptions, came to us from a woman. Being a woman is more than putting lipstick on and high heels. Being a woman is being a very special person. Being a woman is to be a nurturing person with the capability, if God blesses it, and if, if she so desires it, to carry a baby, to form a bond with that baby, and not to declare war. Now, why is all this, I have another question here, why is there so much violence being threatened by these transgender advocates? That's because they're men. These guys are men. They got male aggressive hormones and they love to threaten people. Women don't ordinarily do that. And so I'm gonna leave it there. Trans freedom, you got it. And believe me, I know and have transgendered people close to me and I always have. Trans fraud, pretending you're a woman so you can enter a woman's only category, that is fraud. They've already talked about the fact that one of these entire Scandinavian beauty contests, not that I care one whit about a beauty contest, can be entered with all men. So what are we doing? What are we doing to ourselves? Meanwhile, China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran are trying to figure out when the right time to launch a nuclear missile is. And what are we talking about? Who gets to uh, look at who in the washroom? Thank you for your question. All right, Maurice in Chicago. Do you think the Democrats are afraid that Biden will lose to Trump? Yes, they are scared out of their minds that no matter what they do to Trump, he only gains. They impeached him twice, got four indictments. He's got more indictments against him than Al Capone ever had, than any gangster I've ever investigated. And yet, each time he gets indicted, his approval ratings go up. He's now considered to hold 60% of the Republican pre-electoral vote. And of that 60%, I think 73% believe that these prosecutions are a miscarriage of justice. Now, I don't know if Biden's gonna run. There's something going on here. There's only 10 people on Biden's re-election staff. There's no re-election staff with 10 people as you're going into the primary season. I'm not sure what they're gonna do on the Democratic side, but they are very, very worried that Biden is unpopular, his economics are unpopular, and they don't know what to do about Donald Trump. So that's what's happening. By the way, do I think he should run? I think he's too divisive to run. Do I think he's gonna run? Yes, do I think he's gonna lose to, to a Democrat? It'd be very, very hard because as the Democrats have shown, they would rather elect a dead man than a Republican. Remember, they elected a dead guy in Pennsylvania for a federal position. And they also elected Fetterman when it was clear that he couldn't conduct business. Thank you, Maurice in Chicago. Martin in Los Angeles, what do we do about climate protesters? Well, that's a great question. I'm gonna take the time to answer that. So 
Climate protesters, they're in organizations called the Lester Generation, which is German, which means the last generation, these other people, are some of the single most destructive forces on the planet to refusal to believe in the facts of climate change. Climate change is real. Guys, open up the window, walk outside. It's real, okay? So, but these climate hooligans who tape themselves and cement themselves to streets, to paintings, all they do is create animosity and conflict and it causes people to identify the realities of climate change with the idiocies of what these people are doing. So what should be done about it? First of all, uh, if they're on a the street, um, there's a couple of things. One, uh, if they're obstructing a highway, they should be arrested and charged. In addition, there should be enhancement to a grade A felony if they're blocking an emergency vehicle, whether it's a medical vehicle, whether it's a fire vehicle, if they're blocking in an emergency vehicle. Also, the Good Samaritan laws should be modified. Uh, the Stand Your Ground laws should be modified to allow any person in good faith to use reasonable force to remove uh, people obstructing a highway or destroying artwork, et cetera, et cetera. And if they're actually in a highway or in an art gallery and they want to stay there, you have another choice. Let them stay there. Let them be. Put a little gate around them. Let them protest all day. And after about 24 to 48 hours, they're going to say, I need to take a potty break. And that potty break is not going to be possible. So I think that uh, we should rightfully react against the climate protesters because it distracts and antagonizes the people who should be planning to make adjustments for the climate change that we are seeing. Roger in Boston, did the Israeli foreign ministry terribly misjudge revealing the context with the Libyan foreign minister? Let me just say that uh, the foreign minister is Ali Cohen and he's done a fabulous job. Been flying all over the world, building bridges, cementing bridges, and extending bridges with Africa, with Asia, with countries that never had relations or didn't have relations with Israel for a long, long time. He did meet in Rome with Najla El Mangush, who was the foreign minister. Now remember, there's two governments in Libya, two governments. There's the real government, and then there's the unreal government, and everybody argues about who is the real and who is the unreal real government. So when the Libyan mentioned this, and he probably shouldn't have bragged about it, when he mentioned this, there were all sorts of uh, screams and hollers and threats to the family of the Libyan foreign minister, and she had to flee to Turkey. Now, let me just say that the Mossad has been secretly dealing with Libyan millionaires and important politicians for some months. In fact, uh, it was um, one of the people close to Gaddafi actually flew in and uh, had a private meeting in Ben-Gurion uh, with foreign ministry officials. So there's been a lot of work. It isn't that they just passed by in a hall. A lot of work was done. Actually, the State Department tried to help them. And uh, now it's gone down the toilet. But it's a lesson that some people prefer in the Middle East, prefer to hold a horrible grudge to, we're talking to Jews in Libya, it's a crime to even communicate with a Jewish person. So thank you for your question. The last question, because we're on, running out of time, let's see here is a note. Rudy in Philadelphia, what is your take on the ADL and Elon Musk threatening to sue it for defamation? Okay, I kept the uh, hot question for last. Now I know the ADL. I've worked with the Jewish community for about a half a century with all the organizations of the Jewish community or as many as I could find. But there's no organization I worked with closer than the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League. In fact, I worked with them before they were an independent group when they were known as the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith. I was around when they made the change. I was in the room when the reins of power went to Abraham Foxman, a very good friend. I know plenty about the ADL. 
and I've always been supportive, but the ADL after Foxman is not the ADL that was in existence when I was with them. And there are many people in the Jewish community who feel that the ADL does not represent them, does not represent Israel interests, does not represent Jewish interests. They don't know what it does. And a leader of the ADL actually had the chutzpah to say, I will not support Israel because Bibi Netanyahu has been elected. Many people who that is, and I won't give his name. Now, I normally had great access to the ADL, and I've been asking for about two years now to have an interview with a member of their staff, and they always say that they're busy. In fact, they said they were busy just a few hours ago, and I said, you want to come on? You could say anything you want. They said that they wouldn't come on, they didn't have time. I was curious, but the individual who I know well, uh, communicated, listed his pronouns. So the ADL has got pronouns now. So just a couple weeks ago, then we had uh, a major Jewish activist on who published a book called Betrayal, where he went up against the likes of the ADL and the anti-Jewish community. I have my ground to the ear on the mumbling and, and grumbling within the Jewish community. And it's a topic that's complicated and which I will take up at another time. I don't think Elon Musk is gonna sue for four million, for two billion, for 44 billion, whatever it is. I did see a uh, uninformed remark that Twitter is losing all of their advertisers by one of the people watching now. Hey, guy, you're watching. Listen here. Twitter, now known as X. I'll be using the word X. The Twitter you knew is not the Twitter you're going to see next year. Elon Musk was one of the inventors of PayPal. Elon Musk is going to turn Twitter not into just an unprofitable gossip mill, but into a platform which is going to provide uh, just about everything that Amazon provides and everything that Google provides, and they're going to take a piece of that. So watch for this new entity X to skyrocket without its corporate advertising. Um, nonetheless, uh, the ADL should watch who it slanders and who it defames. And I think that Elon Musk is not anti-Semitic, but he does have a very weird uh, freedom of speech uh, nerve running through his backbone. And that causes him to do certain things and tolerate certain things that you and I normally would not like to see. Okay, so we're out of time. I want you to hold for my closing word of wisdom, just one minute away. But first, I want to thank my esteemed audience and their persistent and excellent questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to everybody, but I'm trying to keep this shorter now. I also thank my talented international team, including Sims in South Africa, Carol in Maryland, and Rebecca in the Philippines for their outstanding work, as well as many others in numerous additional cities around the world. My team, each of them, is comprised of very dedicated people. I and we all owe them. I'll see everyone back here next week at 3 p.m. Eastern. You want to be a friend of The Edwin Black Show? Go to the edwinblackshow.com slash support. Keep me independent. You want to hear me in person? Watch my website for events. I'm in Dallas next month. You can consult my events page at edwinblack.com. Until then, head over to any Barnes & Noble in the USA or any Amazon Walmart, Apple, or Kobo platform in 190 countries across this roiling, toiling, boiling planet where you can find any of my 200 book editions, such as IBM and the Holocaust. God should grant the writer's strike will be over. It'll be a movie. And the Far Hood. You want an autographed copy? Hit my personal newly designed website, edwinblack.com. Click books. Get access to participate live in future shows at the edwinblackshow.com. You'll see a much enhanced and exquisitely produced and documented version of this show and prior episodes by subscribing to our YouTube channel at the Edwin Black Show. Click the notification button like tens of thousands of others have. You will love them. We put new ones up each week, produced by a bold international crew. Follow me at Edwin Black Book on that new thing called X as well as Facebook. And now for my closing word of wisdom. You may judge history, but remember, history will also judge you. Thank you, world. I'm zooming out. Bless you all.